It was well after midnight, and the winds were howling. It was difficult for me to breathe. The warm, moist, tropical air was suffocating. The howl of the wind intensified until the earth started shaking with the rumble. I squinted through my goggles to try to see whether there was pieces, de pieces of debris or full trees being thrown at me at 90 miles an hour. The rain, the wind-driven rain, was piercing through my skin. Even under a layer of clothing, it felt like thousands of hornets were piercing. And during this time, if you were to hypothetically take a picture from inside a hurricane at night, the individual raindrops would be moving so fast that they would show up as streaks of white. And during this time, I fought the winds to try to move to our next vehicle to check on the weather sensors, only to come back again and cling to the side of the radar truck. I looked into the window to see whether or not the radar data was streaming in properly, and my mind started wandering to how little motor control I had. Standing, walking, even breathing became work of labor. And during this time, I also started thinking about the people of Galveston just miles away from where I was standing. Homes were being washed away. Lives were being upturned in just every passing second. And in this moment of mental exhaustion and sensory overload, I broke down and wept. I leaned back against the truck. My teammates came up to me, Owen, is everything OK? What's going on? And I couldn't respond. I just sobbed. Now, normally, when you're deployed on a scientific field experiment, the last thing you think would happen is you would break down in tears for no reason. And yet, it wasn't until the following morning when I woke up to a Coast Guard helicopter landing on the tarmac next to me, did I begin to truly realize what had transpired. In that moment, in that night, standing in the middle of Hurricane Ike when I was being tossed around like a rag doll, I became totally humbled by the extreme power of Mother Nature. Here I was as a research scientist, knowing all these facts and figures about hurricanes, and yet I was totally and utterly powerless against the storm. I could almost hear the cries of anguish from the people just miles away being swept away, and I was totally and completely helpless. It was September 13th, 2008, Hurricane Ike just made landfall in the Galveston area, Houston metro area. And in the, in the coming days, this storm would kill over 100 people across several states, cause over $37 billion in damage, and would become the third costliest hurricane in US history, behind only Hurricanes Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. When I look at a map like this, I've always been fascinated with weather. I've always been intrigued by the power of nature. But before that night, I would have explained to you the satellite picture. I would talk about the spiraling structure of the clouds. I would talk about the dynamics behind what was going on. But after that night, when I see an image like this, I feel the stinging rain, the choking air, and the thousands of lives being changed overnight. And it took standing where that black X was overnight, outside in the elements, to really, truly learn that lesson. Humanity has had a long and storied past. We've come a long way fighting the weather. In the year 1274, Kublai Khan attempted an invasion of Japan with 40,000 troops. But it failed because of a typhoon. He tried again seven years later by assembling 140,000 troops. And yet again, as luck would have it, a typhoon crossed their path and stopped his efforts. So we could very well say that Japanese sovereignty is due to two typhoons, hence the name kamikaze, or divine wind. Fast forward several centuries later, Admiral Halsey of the US Navy fleet in 1944 inadvertently sailed the third fleet into the grips of Typhoon Cobra. With winds of over 100 miles an hour, three destroyers capsized, several carriers listed so sharply that the aircraft fell off into the ocean, 
We lost 790 sailors that day. The greatest US Navy peacetime disaster in its history. Raise your hand if you've watched the weather on TV or you've ever started a conversation with uh, talking about the weather. <laughs> All right, everybody, right? It's so easy to take for granted weather forecast that you just flip on the TV and get or go to some website. But it wasn't until several decades after World War II were we able to launch satellites to see something like this. Just last week, Super Typhoon Haiyan intensified before making landfall with winds estimated at over 190 miles per hour. This type of storm is so rare that right now, this could very well break records for the strongest storm to ever hit a coastline. And when we look at an animation like this, we see the amazing symmetry of the storm, which can allow us to estimate the intensity. And we know now that there's a major humanitarian disaster underway. Over 200,000 people in Tacloban City are without food, water, sanitation. In addition to satellite, we can count on the US Doppler radar network, which again, we take for granted. But these allow us to look inside the most severe thunderstorms, including tornadic thunderstorms. And thanks to this network, we're able to issue tornado warnings on average 13 minutes in advance. And that's plenty of time to get out of harm's way or to seek shelter. In addition to satellite and radar, we also have the ability to communicate across cultures and across countries and collect weather data through weather stations across various airports, giving us the ability to draw maps like this. These are the current weather systems occurring over the North Pacific. But more important than the high and low pressure systems that you see here is the fact that these weather systems do not follow political boundaries. Storm exiting Japan will reach Hawaii or the Western United States in days to weeks. And so in order for us to understand the local weather, we need to count on the global community to provide us information, because weather knows no bounds. All this weather data in the 21st century now, a great advancement, is the use of supercomputers to help us calculate the future of where these storms will be. And we do that through math. Math and more math. If this looks Greek to you, well, it's because it is. <laughs> but these equations summarize all the different forces that govern the motion of a parcel of air. And when we integrate this across space and time, we can actually start to see the evolution of weather systems. And thanks to all of this computing technology, we can issue forecasts like this one by the National Hurricane Center, around five days before Hurricane Sandy actually made landfall. This would have been totally unheard of years ago, in the days of Kublai Khan or even Admiral Halsey, or even 15 years ago, this type of forecast would not have been possible. And yet, even with all of these amazing technological advances, every year we still lose 600 people in the United States to weather. And over 100,000 people die around the world and suffer the same fate. And yet most of these deaths, a lot of these deaths, are actually preventable through better preparation. And so how do we co communicate and better bridge that gap between science, decision making, and the general population? That is the challenge of our day. In order to cultivate community resilience, we must cultivate a culture of preparedness. We can have the perfect forecast. We can have the best warning system. But if the proper actions to protect life and property are not acted upon, those forecasts will be meaningless. And we should not only depend on our government for response and recovery, because the true first responders are our neighbors, our families, and friends. So well before a disaster, get to know your neighbors. Lend a helping hand. Get in the habit of doing that, because that is what truly builds community resilience. But even more than this, we should see science and the humanities is not two separate entities. Instead, they should be viewed as two sides of the same coin. Because without proper communication of the science, we lose the meaning behind it. 
You know, we often hear from those of us trained in the humanities that science is too theoretical or too mathematical to understand. And we hear from scientists that the humanities are too soft, or worse, too boring. I've heard that. Our task now is to break this duality. Imagine a world where the greatest scientific accomplishments can be efficiently and effectively translated to the greater good without sacrificing experimental objectivity. Imagine a world where the general population can view science and the scientific method not as an ivory tower pursuit reserved only for those who love math, but as a conduit whereby we can express our deepest human needs through objective experimentation. Imagine a world where scientists can be inspired by the human condition and humanists can be inspired by the objective pursuits of science. We can build such a world. In fact, the global environmental challenges that we will be facing in the 21st century will demand it. So let's encourage our next generation to value STEM education alongside the humanities. Now, of course, science for the sole purpose of basic research is important and should continue for the purpose of advancing the frontiers of knowledge. But bridging that gap between science and the humanities will be crucial if we want to advance the frontiers of community resilience. Now, this applies to more things than just weather, but weather is perhaps the most visible. This is a picture that I took in southwest Oklahoma several years ago in the heart of a supercell thunderstorm. It's a special type of thunderstorm that has a rotating updraft, and these typically spawn your, your tornadoes. Now, if you were to just gaze upon this picture, it's easy to, to think of storms as a thing to be feared. But if you look at this picture, it's almost a work of art. It almost looks like a column of pottery, right? But these were sculpted by the hands of the winds. And so it goes deeper when we talk about community resilience, because we need to cultivate a mindset where rather than viewing storms as things to be feared, we view them with curiosity, with fascination. And with that, we derive a sense of respect for our environment. And that should be the precursor of any community resilience project we undertake. This picture right here is a scene one year after the Greensburg tornado hit town and destroyed 95% of the city. It's been said that an EF5 tornado is very similar in terms of its damage to a nuclear attack. Foundations are torn up, pavement on roadways can be removed. There is nothing more gut-wrenching than to see the object of your research destroy a house in front of you and being the first on the scene. There's nothing more humbling than to be standing and feeling powerless inside a storm. But there is nothing more uplifting and more encouraging than to see neighbors and strangers lending a helping hand before and after a storm. When you look at this image, you can also think of this. This, is, this used to be a piece of someone's house in Greensburg, Kansas. I keep this on my desk at work to remind myself that no matter how difficult the math equations may be and how technical the science may be, that I should never lose sight of the humanity behind the equations. And this inspires me to think that a small object like this can help me frame the purpose of my work. So I ask all of you, what can you use as a reminder? What can you use to remind yourself of the purpose of your work. We may never be able to tame the untamed skies, but like this object here, that used to be a crucial component of a house, each and every one of us here is a crucial piece of the puzzle on our journey toward building community resilience. So together, we can cultivate community by paying attention to the living laboratory under which we live, fostering scientific curiosity, and nurturing an appreciation for our shared and fragile humanity.